Okay, this should be better, guys. <laughs> this should be it. I'm just doing it through YouTube now. I can't. I can't go through uh, OBS anymore. <laughs> I can't go through uh, OBS. Anymore. All right, we're live. Okay, we're good. Let's just let this. Uh, if all the people that didn't give up hope on me yet, <laughs> let's uh, wait for whoever to get into this chat. Um, this is, we'll be talking about this, and we'll also be talking about this, and my upcoming trip that I'm leaving to on Thursday, which should be fun. So, hello from Mexico. I'm just waiting for more people to come in here. Originally, we had like 50 people watching, but I kept messing up the stream. I don't know how to work OBS. I'm useless with streaming. I need to get on Kofi's level. Let's just let this pile in. Come on in, everybody. So, yeah, it looks great now. It's because I'm just using YouTube now. I didn't know I could use – I'm using the Sony ZV-E1 with the Module 8 L3 tuner. Uh, and then just my mic here. Um, yeah. And I guess YouTube streaming is better now. Yeah. And I guess. Yeah. I'm listening to it and it looks good. Right on. Good job, YouTube. What's up from Australia? I need to put my glasses on. I can't see anything. I don't know. I don't know where my prescriptions are. So we're going to wear my tinted prescriptions. Sorry, I look douchey with uh, sunglasses on. These big bars, yeah, this looks solid. Yeah, shout out to you too for. So, guys, tomorrow, uh, where do you live these days? I'm in Los Angeles again, and I'm already getting burnt out being out here, and I'm itching to move. But that move might get prolonged because tomorrow I'm trading in my Bronco Sport for a full-size Bronco, and uh, it's a lot of debt. So <laughs> that should be fun. Um, yeah, horrible time to probably do it because I just went full-time here on YouTube. So we'll see uh, if it's manageable. What's up from Dallas? All right, so we got 16 people watching. This was a uh, – I always just randomly go on live. So, guys, uh, I'm going to Montana on Thursday. Um, I'm going to shoot uh, – yeah, all the prices are horrible right now. Um, so I'm going to Montana. Uh, I don't know if you guys have been caught up to what I've been up to. Uh, I'm going to take on way less clients now, and I'm putting way more of a focus into YouTube. And uh, it's a little bit stressful because – now all my ducks are in a row, you know, so I got, I just got to hit the ground running. So I'm going to Montana and this is the first time I'm traveling solely for myself and not for a client. So I am just paying for everything myself here. Um, and so with that, uh, I'm going to Montana to shoot an indigenous documentary. We'll be touching on, uh, fashion appropriation and, um, uh, you know, just giving the youth more indigenous things to look up to when it comes to fashion. Um, Thomas is asking, where did my C70s videos go? Uh, I don't know. Uh, as you mean, like, why am I not talking about C7 anymore? I got rid of it. Uh, but if they're not on my channel anymore, uh, I don't know. There's a bunch of Fuji uh, videos that uh, I accidentally privated. Um, and so just like a couple of weeks ago, I put, I put those back public. So I don't, maybe I, I might've went through and like, uh, privated a bunch of older videos. Uh, and then I think a bunch, I think a page or two accidentally got put into those private videos. Um, but yeah, I'm getting rid of the, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I'm getting the full size Bronco and it's pretty sick. They're giving me the best deal that they can. So I'm grateful that they worked that out. But, um, so yeah, anyways, so for the documentary, I was really at a loss of which camera I should take. Let me put this guitar down. So originally, um, 
I have this little film that I shot with the D DZO Anamorphics. Those are actually right behind me. If you guys wanted to know more about those, I could bring those out. Uh, the guy's going to pick them up here in an hour. Um, but yeah, we shot some low light stuff with the FX6 and I only have this thing for a short time. Sorry guys, my allergies are really bad today. And I, I took my Adderall today and Adderall, I kind of dehydrate you. So I right, I'll have to go back and see the C70 stuff is uh, back up. So uh, we shot a little film with the DZO Anamorphics. Um, maybe I'll release it someday. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but we shot a lot of the like night stuff with the FX6. And just using it again, I was like, I missed this camera. I still have a few gripes with this. And they're little gripes, but there are enough gripes that kind of annoy me enough to not use it. Because uh, this thing's supposed to be a workhorse. And it is. But this, those little things uh, really annoy me. Um, but... I think I'm going to take the red Komodo X. So I just kind of want to talk about these two cameras and my choice. And maybe you guys can sway my decision here. If you guys think I should take the FX6 instead of uh, the Komodo X. So yeah, um, the reason I'm taking the Komodo X is I want max image quality. Um, again, this is like my first project that I'm doing solely for myself and self-funding. Uh, one second, guys, got to clear my nose. Okay, hopefully that actually muted it. <laughs> I just had a snort. Um, so yeah, the, the image quality that comes out of this is just next level if you know how to color grade. Um, and I'll be using a ready rig. Maybe I'll slap the ready rig on if you guys want to see what that looks like on here. Uh, but once this was on the ready rig, um, I was pretty solidified in my choice because this camera, uh, again, all you have to do is slap a lens on this and that's it. And this is way lighter. This alone is like the same weight and with nothing else on it. No monitor, no, no, nothing else. Um, but yeah, the ready rig is what's making me uh, confident and comfortable with using this for the documentary. Uh, so I'll be able to get my max image quality and I won't have a bunch of discomfort. Um, so yeah, I actually use even the FX6 if you're on your feet. So I shot an indigenous cowboy documentary that comes out. Uh, this winter. I don't know what form it will come out. I know, I guess some of it's going to be previewed on CBS. Um, but we'll see. We, we have a uh, premiere in November. I won't say where and all that. It's more of a private premiere. And uh, so, yeah, but half of it I shot on the FX6 and even the FX6 just handheld, you still kind of break your back because like um, I'm only like 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, so a lot of times I'm having to kind of aim up um, and it's still, when you're shooting cowboy stuff or anything in Montana, just on site or on location outdoors, it gets uh, a little backbreaking at the end of the day. Uh, so the ready rig paired with this, I'm super confident with this setup. Um, but yeah, let's bring in some questions. Uh, I'll answer some questions first and then we'll go more into this. And I kind of want to go over the pros and cons of each camera um, and why I lean on the Komodo X uh, when it comes to documentary stuff. Let's go through the comments first. Let's see. Yeah, the FX6 is pretty great. As a C70 R5C shooter, I hate to say this, but the FX6 would be my choice. It's what we use at work. Yeah, guys, the FX6 is just a, literally a perfect, like it does everything. They're just, I'll, I'll go into little gripes uh, about the FX6 for me. <laughs> I don't have my RF lenses. I might get like a 24 to 105 F4 uh, for the Komodo, but we'll see. Yeah, KX is a great move. Yeah, the KX is just like, it's it's insane. It's up there in quality. I have not tried Sony RAW on DaVinci. Well, I did download some uh, Venice and Venice 2 footage, uh, and it looks great. Um, it looks similar to like any other RAW pretty much. Yeah, audio inputs on FX6 are solid, but that's one of my gripes is you have to use the top handle in order to get those audio inputs. So say if I want to do a cool rig and like on a gimbal or something like that, but I want to keep the audio on there. So say if I'm trying to do um, cinematic documentary filmmaking with a gimbal and blah, blah, blah. 
you can't you have to run external audio then i kind of like external audio is cool if you have a team i'm shooting solo um and so that immediately rolls this camera out for me uh, if i want to use a gimbal on a documentary that's very 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 annoying uh the sony fx2 they better put audio ports on this sony if you do not put audio ports on this uh, <laughs> I don't even know. Uh, I'm not going to leave Sony only because their cameras are freaking like the FX3. This is, uh, I have the FX3 and uh, I'm obsessed with this camera. And part of me would uh, honestly be okay shooting a documentary on that camera, but um, I got to try, I got the Komono X now. I got to try it out. Um, but yeah, the audio ports, missing audio ports here. Very, very, very annoying. Sony, please give us audio ports on the body. And there's no 3.5. Uh, jack on here and so say if i want to use my dji wireless uh microphones i'm gonna have to do an xlr adapter and figure that out and if that doesn't split properly to the stereo channels it doesn't work it's very annoying um so at least give us a 3.5 millimeter jack like come on sony so that was one of my gripes it's like if i'm gonna have to rig up audio anyways i might as well it's it's gonna be the same thing on this i'm gonna have to rig it up anyways on this uh so that was one thing Let's go back to comments. I'll get back in the gripes on this. <laughs> Half of the way is the Mofage. Uh, the Mofage adapter actually isn't that heavy at all. Um, and this thing is super clutch. Uh, the ND goes up to seven stops, I think, uh, which for me is enough. I'm not someone that's trying to shoot anything at 1.2 or 1.8, especially a documentary. You're just going to make your life hell trying to uh, keep up with focus on that. Um, yeah. Makes sense to use the camera with the highest bit rate in eternal raw video. <clears throat> so guys, remind me to go into that. The Komodo is actually a great run and gun camera and it saves your ass in a lot of situations because of the way you can expose on it and the raw capabilities and be able to stretch that in post. Um, and I could, so when I was shooting the digital cowboy documentary, again, the FX six was great. There's a couple of times where I underexposed, uh, and to bring like sometimes the, the shadows would clip because I underexposed too much. I was messing with the auto ND and I didn't have have it set up properly. Uh, and raw, you could probably recover a lot more. That's the biggest difference. So say if I expose at ISO 800 on both of these and I clip the blacks on both. On raw, you can get away with a lot more because you could boost that ISO to 1600 and post. And magically you have a little bit more information. So as long as the RGB weren't clipping on the sensor you could recover it if the rgb isn't clipping on this sensor but you don't expose it correctly you're not gonna have as much recoverability in post just because there's not that raw workflow let's see so i'm sniffling guys again it's allergies um message hit i don't see what that message was uh kicks great move i'm editing doc series ep and yeah it's gorgeous uh let's see how's the komodo x's autofocus i have not tried the autofocus i have zero rf class and i again I might pick up a 24 and 105 rf but that's it do you find your 12,800 iso footage difficult to denoise no here's the issue People hear 12,800 ISO, so they think they could shoot into a like a black blanket and they're going to get an image out of it. That's not how physics works. Like You still need light hitting that sensor. Even if it's at 12,800 ISO, if you don't have light hitting the sensor, you're just going to get noise on any sensor. That's just how the physics of, of all of it works. So if you're pushing the low light capabilities, there's going to be noise. Again, whatever light you get on there, that's your exposed image. Um, so you guys will see the low light, uh, like uh, the film that we shot for the DZO, we were shooting in the middle of the night, almost zero moonlight. All we had to expose was the skylight and the backdrop that the moon was hitting. We were tucked into mountains and so uh, the mountains were blocking the moonlight. And so we had a, we set up a nanolite Pavel tube way out and we set it to 10% and that was enough to at least put some light onto uh, on my face and, uh, and post that my secret tool that I use for uh, low light recovery is a neat video. Neat video has been around for like a decade now. And it was like the, the secret weapon back in the day. And it's still the secret weapon. I don't know why people don't really talk about neat video. Um, 
Maybe I'll do a video on that. I don't know. I'll hit them up and see if they want to work with me on something on that. Uh, but yeah, again, just because you have 12,800 uh, ISO does not mean it's night vision. Let's see. Do you miss your C70? The FX6 is incredible. I think having the KX is the kit can help alleviate the want for C70. I do not miss my C70 at all. Uh, I did not care. <clears throat> Again, the image, I think the C70's image is like the best image that Canon has for that price range. Um, but the low light, uh, or not the low light, uh, the uh, build quality of it, I was not confident in the build quality and uh, I didn't like the ergonomics on it. It was similar to the FX6 where you have to have, like if you want to use any of the, the autofocus or touchscreen stuff, you have to have the monitor open plus the monitor like your, your monitor that you're going to use to see the image. So it's kind of annoying to have to use both of those. FX6 is similar, but you can ditch this monitor if, you, if you're just using like PL lenses. Um, it's just fine. You could just get rid of this. You don't need it. I do wish that the FX6 II has a proper monitor on there that's actually daylight visible. That was the other gripe with this. This monitor, and if you're doing like an interior scene, this monitor's just fine. But outdoors, it's totally useless. Like it's it's pure, just it's it's useless. So that was my other gripe is I still had to put an external monitor on there. And the annoying thing, trying to break an external monitor, this hot shoe is kind of delicate. You don't want to put a big old monitor on there. It doesn't feel safe. And then it puts the monitor way up here as well. Uh, there's ways to rig it out, but like there's no good solution. Like Sony didn't give us a good solution to rig up other monitors on here. Uh, so that was the other annoyance is having to fidget with all of that. So again, a big solution of this would is be if they would just put audio ports on the body of this and we could choose our own top handle and rig our own, our own monitor however we wanted to. So again, like all these gripes that I have with the FX6, they're tiny, but they're enough to where I still have to rig out the camera and deal with the gripes. So it's like, why would I just use the Komodo X and get raw capabilities and a little bit better of an image quality? Let's see. Are there internal NDs in the Komodo? No, but I have the Poco, uh, the Mofage Poco VND. Let me show you guys this. So in this, let me see if this will focus on there. I don't know if it's got, there it goes. So in this is, uh, this, it's going to hunt. Let's get this out. So in this adapter is a V and D and you can see, I will hold this up here. You can look at my face there. You can see as I turn it, it darkens. So it's basically like the same V and D you put on the front of your lens. Um, but it goes in the back of here. So any of your PL lenses you put on there, majority of PL lenses uh, will fit. Some of them, the uh, rears are too long. And so they will um, hit the glass and they won't work on here. Uh, but this is basically like having internal ND. It's not as smart as, uh, it's not as smart and clean as the FX6 is, but it gets the job done. I just can't see buying all new lenses to make the Sony, or the, make the switch to Sony. Yeah, the hard part is, I don't know what you're shooting on. Is it, I'm assuming uh, uh, Canon. Um, the thing is, it's like, it's either you're forever going to be waiting for Canon to finally give you the camera you need, and they might not ever do that. And if they do, it might be $10,000, $12,000, who knows. Um, so it's either you keep waiting for that and you deal with it. Obviously, if your workflow works just fine for it, there's no reason to switch. But if you're contemplating switching to Sony, just because everything's easier with Sony, get better dynamic range, better low light performance, uh, way more lens choices, way more bodies to choose from and a mix and match. Um, like I own a few Sony cameras right now. Um, then it's kind of worth it. Um, it's either switch now or switch later, you know, if you're, if you're planning on switching, how much harder is the KX versus the FX six? How much harder Taos? I don't know what word yo, Toby Moto, Toby Moto, sorry, probably butcher your name. Uh, if you can correct, I don't know how much harder Taos is the KX. I don't know. I don't know what that means. Um, what's up, Carlos? Carlos C. 
I mean, since the 18.5 update, DaVinci reads the FX6 files of Sony Raw. It allows you to change the ISO white balance and and, and sell and post. Yeah, that's not real raw though. That's just uh, it's just it's basically using DaVinci's white balance corrector, but it's a whole different just a different tool to do it. Uh, it's not actual raw. Um, like, sure, it's great because you can get more accurate changes to where uh, if you use DaVinci's white uh, balance tool, it's like. Uh, let me change it by 100%, 200%, uh, 1200%, whatever it is. Where on the Sony one, you can just go in there and you can just change it. But again, that's not real raw. It's still a 10-bit Kodak. This is getting a 16-bit raw. I know some people argue, oh, it's still 12-bit, whatever. Uh, actually using it, you get way more color fidelity. You see all the different tones and and like the, the flesh tones and the, the blood tones and everything and skin tones when you're shooting on a this 16-bit Kodak in here. Uh, so it's a night and day thing. So it's not just having the raw flexibility in post. It's the actual bit death and uh, color depth that you're getting out of the Kodak internally. The top handle doesn't bother me. I actually like it. I'm blessed and own the FX3 if I need to get a gimbal cam. Yeah, so I originally got rid of the FX6. I just own this for a period. It's a weird trade thing. Um, after I got the FX3, uh, and again, all the rigging you have to do on the FX6, it's kind of annoying uh, to where I was like, on the FX3, I have to do all the same rigging. And all I'm losing is um, the internal NDs. And so for me, having to, like this takes up half my bag and all the extra pieces and little bits that you have to use to rig this out, it just, it was annoying to where on the FX3, it takes a tiny portion of my bag with all the same pieces. So um yeah, once I tried the FX3, I was like mind blown because you could put on a gimbal, you could make it handheld, you could put it on the side of a car, you could put on a tiny tripod, you could put on a monopod. Like it's so much more useful. Uh, so again, the FX6 too, I hope Sony fixes all those gripes because uh, I would probably, well, I'm uh, I'm going to make a video on like on the FX6 too and what it needs for me to switch. Um, and yeah, I would definitely switch back to FX2. Uh, especially if you got internal raw because again that's the whole point of owning this komodo is that internal raw uh it's just it's game changing i don't want to say game changing it's game changing if you know how to color grade if you're doing bigger projects and working on teams and stuff just ha having the extra latitude really just will make your work go up a notch if you know what you're doing yeah see a lot of people saying they hit the top handle want to gimbal fx6 how often do you do that so Carlos is saying, I still understand why someone would want to gimbal an FX6 because here's the thing. Say if uh, you were shooting a music video and the budget's $10,000 and you have five people on the team and the budget's maxed out and you can't afford to rent another camera or you don't want to bring one of your cameras because, you know, the budget's not there and you don't want to risk it or just put in, you know, whatever. Um, and you have multiple setups. Why wouldn't you want to put the FX6 on a gimbal. Grant, if it's a music video, you don't need audio. But say if I'm doing a, a documentary and I'm shooting it solo, I don't want 10,000 cameras on me. I just want one camera. And I want to be able to rig it out to where I can slap on a gimbal quick, shoulder rig quick, uh, ready rig quick. Oh, ooh, that's hard to say. Ready rig quick. Um, the FX6 makes that a little bit difficult because you lose that audio as soon as you lose that top handle. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'm probably going to get the mid-49 XLR adapters as well, or either red ones. I'm waiting for someone to make an XLR and 3.5 uh, adapter, like a combo adapter on there. Let's see. How much footage are you planning to shoot for in a day? Yeah, so someone's saying, how long I plan to shoot? Um and talking about battery life and efficient Kodaks to avoid missing shots. <clears throat> yeah, so for this, I'll probably shoot ELQ. Um, I know a lot of people are like, oh, you need to shoot an MQ. Jared, the CEO of Red or President, I don't, I don't know what his thing is uh, on there anymore. Um, even he said that the MQ on the new uh, Red cameras is the equivalent to the highest quality on DSMC2 cameras. So I'll shoot LQ all day. Uh, I'm not doing individual effects. Like it, I don't need all the extra stuff. Um, I don't think you're really losing uh, like color depth or uh, image quality per se, but I think you're losing more 
like clarity and sharpness, which I'm totally fine with. Like I'll just use sharpening a pose. Blaine, bro. I don't even know you're subscribed to me, bro, or if you're just catching this live, but I'm a huge fan of what you've been doing. I keep telling all my DP buddies who are on the field, we need you guys on YouTube because we need more people from the field bringing in more education to YouTube because there's a weird mix where uh, a YouTuber, say a YouTuber who's not filming on production sets or anything like that, some of the things that they say are from their own perspective where some people who might be watching them are looking for a different perspective and they get the wrong idea from it. And so we need more people from you know both sides to kind of intermingle and teach each other both sides and both ends and just make this community a more balanced uh, situation and uh, with better education. So shout out to you, Blaine. Sorry, a little tangent there. Um, but yeah, for uh, how much I plan on filming in a day, uh, I'll be in the ELQ mode. Um, but also I'm very, uh, I don't want to say I'm precise on what I film, but I'm very picky because I'm going to be editing this. I know my style of editing. So I know if the clip's not going to make it to the edit, I don't even bother with it. Uh, if I feel it's going to be a gamble, I'll just roll anyways, but I'll still be kind of choosy on how long I'm rolling for. Um, and so, yeah, I've been, uh, I've been a photographer for like 12 years now and then video I've been dabbling for the past, I mean, since then, but the past six years and the past three or four years, I've been doing video more seriously. And, um, with that, I've done a lot of editing for myself and my clients and I've developed my own style that my clients liked, uh, to the point where they would have me edit the projects instead of their in-house editors. Um, and so that just comes from years of trial and error and it's still developing. I'm still figuring it out, especially as I get into more narrative work and documentary work, uh, like the feature length documentary I shot, we hired an editor for that. And I'm so glad we did that because that's a 45 minute doc. And, uh, there's no way I would have been able to undertake that. Uh, and that was back before I was on Adderall. Uh, so, <laughs> um, I don't even know if I should be saying that on a live. I don't know if YouTube's going to, uh, <laughs> dock this. The car on the stream is great. Are using a LUT while streaming? Yeah, so I'm using my own S-Log3 LUTs uh, internally on the ZVE1. I think this is my uh, film cream LUT. Um, but also this is lit. I'm using uh, a light panel on here. I have a Zhiyun X100 just as like that kicker. And then my little lamp here just as like my motivation, my uh, practical. Um but yeah, this is set up specifically for this way. And again, I have the module eight L3 tuner on here. This is at minimum. I don't know if you guys can even see on the stream. There's probably not, uh, not enough details to really see what this is doing. And then this is at 10. So yeah. And then the autofocus pumping is probably not helping either. Kofi. Guys, Kofi. We got a lot of things in the works, guys. There's a lot of exciting things that uh, that we'll both be doing. We're kind of running in parallels right now. Uh, so it's exciting to have a, a homie who's like kind of right there when we're by each other's uh, sides throughout this. So it's going to be cool. When is having too much gear hinder gear? Let me see. Let me start. When is having too much gear a hindrance? Wait, no, no. Let me try this again. <laughs> when is having too much gear hinder you in just going and making work? I don't mean this in a negative way. Their tech is crazy these days. Okay. I'm sure you guys understood that. Um, uh, for me, it's not a hindrance at all. It's it's like having a tool chest with different type of wrenches. Uh, that's how I see it. <clears throat> like I never have a delay. I'm like, oh, I'm not going to go shoot this because I have too many cameras to pick from. No, that's in my mind. That's silly. Again, when I got started, uh, there wasn't so many gear options and so many like we weren't so spoiled. And so for us, gear was just gear. And as YouTube became more of a thing, uh, I think gear has become like a hype type culture. Uh, and granted, I might be a part of that. I do enjoy gear. I enjoy talking about it. I enjoy trying new things out and testing things and seeing if I can apply that to uh, my own personal projects. Um, but it's never been a hindrance. I don't know. It's the same thing when uh, someone's like, oh, I need to take a break from Instagram. I'm like, I don't think that's going to help your obsession with it. I think you should in that moment look at Instagram as a different thing as in like, I look at Instagram as a community to communicate and to market. Uh, that's strictly how it is. And so if I'm on it too much, I'm like, Oh, I'm just wasting time on here. Let me get off of this. Uh, so it's the same mindset. I don't know. I don't know. I might've been an old grumpy man response. Sorry. 
let's see. Um, love the work, just getting back into photography and learning video. Appreciate you for the inspiration. Thank you. Um, let's see. Do you only shoot docs with zooms or would you use primes? So for this documentary, I will be using my Lawa nanomorphs. Um, that I really want to use the DZO uh, uh, Pavo anamorphics, but I have to return those by the 18th. I'll be gone by then, so I'm just I'm the, they're gonna come pick them up tonight. I'm really bummed. Um, we should talk about those a little bit. Um, and I was gonna use the Atlas Mercury's, but I don't think I'll be able to get loners in time. Uh, shout out to Atlas. I absolutely love the Atlas Mercury, especially for dock work because say uh, if you have to do a 16 by nine deliverable. You can still shoot an anamorphic and still get that deliverable easily and not lose too much resolution. Where on 2x anamorphic, it's kind of hard to get to that 16 by 9 deliverable. So um uh, we'll see. Again, I'm gonna go buy that car that I can't afford, but I really want it. So <laughs> um yeah, if I get enough time, I might stop by. I know Atlas, um, their headquarters in Burbank, they're gonna have the Sony Burano in their office and they're going to be putting the Mercury's and the Orion's on there. So maybe I'll stop by there tomorrow if I have time. We'll see. Maybe Taos is to use. Let's go read that comment back then to use. Where was it? Where was it? Okay. We lost it. So we're going to have to move on from that. Sorry if you just heard my stomach growling. Um, uh, so yeah, so I'm using primes. I will be taking my Lala Ranger 75 to 180 though. Um, so when it comes to zooms, uh, previously I've only used autofocus zooms because if I'm getting a zoom shot, I'm tracking a cowboy livestock or I'm getting like a landscape and I don't need like a crazy zoom. Um, uh, but I absolutely love how the Lala Rangers look. They have this softness, um, to the edges of like the the highlight like the highlight roll off is gorgeous there's some slight chromatic aberration which i love uh i like having a little bit more sauce on my lenses i don't like clinical at all i'm over clinical uh i'll post another video ranting about uh companies giving us lens options i just noticed my asin r5s uh just out and open let's see what we got next how much harder is it to use the KX versus the FX6? Uh, it's not harder, I would say, at all. They have different strengths for different things. Um, so internal NDs, FX6, it's great. Again, I have the Mofage Poco VND on here, and this thing's amazing. absolutely love this thing. But what's cool is you have the auto END, where uh, in one of my previous videos, one of the past like five videos, I showed a clip from that documentary on how the auto and for documentary stuff is insane. It is just stunning. Um, but with that, everything else, again, because you still have to kind of rig this thing out uh, if you're using anything specific with it, same way you have to rig this out. Um, this is heavier for sure, but again, I'm going to be using the ready rig with this. Why well, I like the Komodo a little bit more for run and gun stuff. One, when you're shooting in the raw, like the raw just gives you a little bit more uh, capabilities in post to stretch that footage if you know how to color grade. There's a lot more uh, color info in the noise floor uh, and the dynamic range on this, if that makes sense. Um, but the RGB channels, let me boot this up and show you guys real quick. Uh, while this is booting up, someone did ask, I saw, uh, something about boot up times. Where'd that go? Jason, what up? Bro, what time is it in uh, Australia right now? I'm losing the chat, y'all. Uh, the KX boot and black shading is shorter. Oh, Kofi, but still on the FX6. Yeah, uh, so the boot up time, guys, like, I don't know how many people are in situations where they need to, like, be quick on click and record if they miss something. I don't know anybody that's turned off their camera during those moments um carry extra battery with you like that's it's that easy and even with the fx6 like i'm pretty conservative when it comes to my battery life i turn it off when i don't need it um but yeah like you should be preparing enough time beforehand 
to give it a minute to boot up and a minute to black shade. And it doesn't even take that long to boot up or to black shade. So to me, that's not an issue. I don't have a damn battery on here. Okay. Let's first put a battery on here and then let's boot this up. Um, let's see. Before we go into the RGB and the traffic lights on here, um, let's see. Red workflow for Sony workflow storage, better value. It's the same, y'all, because again, if you want to shoot in uh, the 10 bit on the FX6, you can't shoot in H265. You can't shoot in uh, the long GOP. You have to shoot in the all I. So it still takes up a lot of space. Granted, this might take up a little bit more space. Might might not be that much, though. I'll have to check. Um, but I prepare, I have like six terabytes of SSDs with me, and I have a fair, four terabyte uh, Lacey drive for backup. Um, so you kind of just, if again, if you want to get the big boy shots, the big boy quality, you got to get big boy storage, I guess. I don't know. Um, so let me just turn off this all the folks right here. Let's lock this off. So get the eyelash off of there where that is so you guys can see these rgb channels this is what's super sick about red um if these are clippings right now obviously i have a uh actually let me put a lens on let's put uh the dzo anamorphic one sec sorry y'all let's uh just put this on. So this is the DZO. This is a 2X anamorphic. Let me grab, uh, let's see. So this is the Lawa nanomorph. Um, let me do focus here. I should probably put this back in auto. So this is the Lawa nanomorph. This is the DZO uh, Pavo anamorphic. This is 1.5X. This is 2X. This is what's crazy about the DZO anamorphics. And these are both super 35 lenses. Um, I don't know how DZO is getting 2X in here. On top of that, I don't know, like the the distortion, the, the Lawa nanomorphs are very, very, very clean, which is cool because in post you can add your own sauce if you want to. Uh, but the DZO Pavos, they have a little bit more character that I prefer. Um, let's see if I get this autofocus back on. So I personally prefer more vintage character on my uh, shots. So I know there's a lot of people who are like, oh, the, the anamorphic's not clean or wide open. It's soft or there's chromatic aberrations. If you're someone who's saying that, I wonder if you like actual vintage anamorphics. Um, if you do, I feel like you should have an appreciation that there's this modern lens that's kind of harking back to similar characteristics of it. But um, anyways, enough ranting. Always ranting me. Okay, let's uh, put this back in manual. Sorry, y'all, I'm trying here. Let's go a little bit closer. All right, so the RGB traffic lights over here. So you see right now it says it's peaking, but it's not peaking, peaking, like we're on the edge of peaking. So if I shut my aperture down, actually let's shut down the, um, the Poco VND up here. So you see, as I close down my ND, it's neutral. So what's cool about this is we're not losing any highlight or shadow details. No matter what I set my ISO to, um, or my shutter, or yeah, well, mainly my, sorry, let me start over. Whatever, well, no matter what I set my ISO to, these traffic lights don't change because this is the raw light hitting the sensor. As long as these are good in post, you can, stretch that ISO wherever you want and you're going to have all the information. Then you see if I open it back up or now I'm closing down, you see now our, our shadows are peaking. We're going to open back up. So this is all the way open. Let me play my aperture here or let me just swing this up toward the light. So you can see now our highlights are peaking. Let me close down the VND. Let me get focus as well. So you see as I close this down, those traffic lights will start going down. So again, as long as those traffic lights are safe, you have a good exposure. Um, obviously, when it comes to like narrative stuff and lighting stuff, it's a totally different thing. But once again, if you're shooting documentary and you're doing run and gun stuff, as long as that's good in post, you're going to be able to stretch it and make it look however you want. That's what's sick about this camera. Uh, I, 
I'm trying to equate if there's anything like that in the FX6, the FX3, or any other camera. There's really not. It's not the same thing as a histogram because the histogram is affected by your overall exposure. Those RGB traffic lights are strictly the light hitting the sensor. So that's what's sick about that. Let me turn this back off now. And also, this is that rig. Uh, pretty cool uh, with the Poco, the Mofage Poco VND and uh, the anamorphic there. All right, next question. We're on tangents here. Tangents. Jason Morris, shout out to you again, bro. Boot up times made me choose FX6 over the KX in my recent mini doc. Other than that, the KX is insanely amazing. Yeah. Like I said, like even, so I'm going to be shooting a lot of like, uh, I might be shooting some cowboy stuff on this. It's mainly going to just be on location, Montana type stuff. Um, I have 250 watt V mounts and 290 watts. So I'm just going to let that baby cook. Um, dang, the chat is lit right now. I'm trying to catch up here. Kaz said, how do you manage the massive RD3 file size for dock work? Uh, I don't know if you're here for that, but just you need to bring hard drives. It's the only way around it. And I shoot an ELQ mode. Bugs in here. From where fingers crossed. Yep. <sighs> What's up, dog? Camera rigging mods. Guys, go check out his channel. Uh, if you need any inspiration for rigging stuff out, uh, he's probably got a video on it. Let's see. Just bought a7s3 upgrade from the a60 or a6000. So I had to learn about color grading and find my style like everyone else. Yeah, that's what's cool about the Sony's is like for what they are, we're getting some of the best dynamic range and uh, uh, color depth, I think. And so uh, when it comes to color grading, you can really push it however you like. Like the whole debate that uh, Sony has bad color science, it's so ridiculous because log is like kind of like a standardized format now so we're able to um mathematically change it to whatever log we want it to be with photos there's not as much of a standardization uh when it comes to raw photos but there still are tricks to changing that so like in capture one any photo that i shoot on my a7r5 i change the base characteristics to the r5c just because uh canon's color science for photos are a little bit easier to start off for me to get my filmic look that I like. I still do a Sony, but it takes a few more steps. Uh, and they're easy steps. They like take five seconds to do, but it's just easier for me to just switch it to the Canon. Uh, and also because I shot Canon for forever, so I'm just kind of used to those colors. So let's say they're trying to choose between these two cameras for the first camera. They're both great cameras. Uh, they're both like similar, but totally different at the same time. Yeah, so Kofi saying if the FX6 Mark II had onboard audio, open gate, and the OCN LT, uh, which is the raw light, I believe, uh, even if it's a paid upgrade. Yeah, it would be game over. Yeah, so my wish list for the FX6 II that will get me to leave the Komodo X, just as Kofi said, uh, I would like 6K um, only because when it comes to those jobs or gigs or shoots or whatever that you want to also get like vertical content out of it uh 4k is still fine uh, but i wouldn't mind having a little bit more crop play in post uh, but that's not like a game changing thing but 6k sensor the same fast readout global uh or not global shutter uh uh uh, uh what's it called <laughs> open gate i think it's open gate and better internal anamorphic support because all these affordable anamorphics more people are going to be jumping on the anamorphic train uh, an internal raw light. If they have those things, oh, an onboard audio. Uh, I would sell my Komodo X in a heartbeat, honestly. Honestly. So basically a mini Burano. That's what we need. I would be all over it. I hope all is well. What is a good budget cinema camera? Uh, I mean, it depends on what, what field and depth you are on it, but... Um, I would start off with the Sony a7S III. It's probably your cheapest option. Hell, even the ZV-E1 that I'm shooting on right now will be a great option. I could shoot the whole documentary on the ZV-E1 and have no issue with it. I would still have to rig it out and everything, uh, but it worked work just fine. But again, I own the Komodo X, so why not use the Komodo X? And it gets the top quality of all the cameras I own right now. Which I think some would think is debatable, but it's not. 
All the creators up in here. Yeah. We got a dope little community going on uh, on here now. Very grateful for all the homies I made on this space. The only reason I would go the FX sick is the S and Q button. Switching between real time and SQ is much quicker. So it just really depends. Ah, uh, maybe the issue with S and Q though is you lose your audio. Where on the Komodo, I could simply just tap, drag, and my frame rates are changed. It's that quick on there. Uh, it's not an issue at all. Uh, you don't lose audio, but the audio file becomes detached after a certain frame rate. Uh, and we're getting up to 80 frames per second on the full sensor readout, which is crazy on that. Let's see. I should talk more about my shoots. Maybe I'm back. Yeah. Tell me more about the shoots. I'll be able to recommend something better probably. We can see the bokeh difference on the tuner better if the focus is on something closer than your face. Um, actually, it'd be better if there was an object in front of me, me here in the back, because the L3 shifts different depths of focus. It's pretty cool. Uh, a simple talking head setup might not show it that well. And also, I don't know what the bit depth is on this live. So I don't know how well that's going to show up. That's dope to hear, Carlos. You use my LUTs. Dude, if you got any dope shots and they look cool at my LUTs, feel free to uh, DM me on Instagram so I can see. Yeah, Kofi said the, the Lawa nanomorphs are growing on him. These things are great options for the price. I think this these are like 1200 bucks each and you get 1.5x anamorphic. You're still getting some flares. You're still getting some, you know, anamorphic uh, uh, waterfall bokeh. As you go up to the 65 and 80 millimeter, you're going to get way more bokeh, like stretch bokeh out of those. With wider anamorphics, if you don't have a whole lot of extra character in there, uh, you kind of lose the anamorphic look. That's why I like the Atlas Mercury's because they're also 1.5, but there's way more character to those lenses. Have you messed around with using the Mercury and tuning the camera sideways for square for format you crop later? Uh, Kyle Madison. No, honestly, I don't care for square formats at all. Uh, obviously, I like open gate for anamorphic use, but as a deliverable, I'm not on that hype train. I don't get it personally. It's not my uh, steez. I think people like it because it looks like, like vintage film shots, like medium format film. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't get it. Uh, let's see. How do you manage gear while flying? I do my best to keep my lenses and camera bodies in my carry on, but still I get so, so paranoid checking the rest of my gear. That's really hard. Um, I own both Peter McKinnon bags, the larger one and the trout or the day size one. Uh, the larger one, I could fit pretty much any of my kits into there, all my lenses and my camera bodies. And, uh, obviously you have to choose what to leave behind, uh, when you're flying, but yeah, that's usually what I take. And then, uh, I check in my, um, my luggage. So all my clothes and all that stuff. And then I usually have, um, like a second bag. It might be my laptop bag or, uh, maybe a different case or something as a carry on. And if they ever, you know, half the time now they're like, Oh, the flight's packed. Um, usually then, uh, I, if they, pick me to check in my luggage. I beg them and I show them what's in there. I was like, please let me take this on. And I've gotten lucky so far with that. Where do I get my camera skins? Alpha guard. So there's a couple places you get these skins <clears throat> and, um, alpha guard is the only one that has actual, like the texture of their skins and the thickness make it feel like it's, it's actual material. Um, I bought in some off like Alibaba when like, uh, alpha guard didn't have like the exact skins I needed. Um, and they're, they're not anywhere close to it. So I would go through alpha guard. Um, I think I have a discount code and all that, but I wouldn't be bothered with it. Just go and buy one. Uh, I'm sure you can find a discount code somewhere. It's worth it though. And they're not crazy expensive either. Greens from Guatemala. Shout out. I got Kofi. Got it. Am I going to make a creator rig Komodo edition? Um, I don't know. Uh, because, uh, wait, Kofi, I'm going to add you as a moderator here. Mm 
<clears throat> okay. Um, oh, oh, this is not going to let me. Oh, now I just ruined my thing. Oh, geez. Oh, geez. What did I do? What did I do? I did something. All right. There it goes. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry, y'all. Um, am I going to make a creator rig Komodo edition? Um, I saw a bunch of people have been making the rig videos and I'm a little bit flustered with them because they're just doing shoulder rigs with gimbals on them. That wasn't what the creator rig was about. The creator rig was being able to go shoulder mount it or be able to go, you know, uh, the briefcase mode on it or be able to just go handheld mode with it. And it was compact and concise and exact. Um, so I do kind of want to dabble. I know camera rigging mods, he's going to be making a more compact version. So I think the way that they did it was perfection. Um, just because again, you can actually use it as like a low flying gimbal camera still. Um, so I don't know. I don't really have time to do it. So we'll see. Are you missing full frame? No, because I still have the FX6, the FX3, A7R5, um, this uh, Sony ZV-E1's on loan to me right now. Uh, full frame is great. Um, Super 35 can be great too. Um, in my opinion, Super 35 digital sensor is a little bit more limited unless you're shooting some with the Komodo X because they're pumping way more power to that sensor and you're getting way more Kodak and information out of it. So um, it's kind of debatable there. What mic are you using for this stream? I'm using this AKG. I don't want to hit it too much. Um, yeah, it's just like this vintage looking AKG mic. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's pretty much it. I don't know if you want any more info on that. <laughs> Let's see. Let me angle that down. Sorry, y'all, if it's uh, hitting the mic everywhere. Um all right, I think I've been on here for an hour so far, so we got to wrap this up soon. Still a lot of comments to get through. Let's try it. <clears throat> All right. Uh, super stoked for this documentary, which indigenous group? Um, so not to be a jerk, but it's not indigenous group. Uh, we go, it's by tribes and people and nations. And um, But yeah, I'll be going to Crow Nation. Um, I don't want put too much info out on there because uh yeah uh just for privacy reasons um uh, but it's going to be about fashion uh appropriation cultural appropriation um and yeah we'll be highlighting some youth we'll be highlighting a fashion designer who's been in vogue a bunch um she's like one of the og and like top fashion designers who's a uh, native american and um <clears throat> all her fashion designs are based off the crow uh tribe and uh, yeah, so we'll be touching on how some fashion brands, you know, still designs and why that hurts uh, the indigenous community and um, also highlighting youth and why the native youth, they don't have traditional people to look up to. It's uh, just like a lot of the other minority groups out there. It's like when you watch a movie that was made 10 years ago, it's like, was there anybody that they could really look up to that was highlighted in a good way? Let's see. EOQ on the Komodo takes up to 5x more space than the 10-bit all eye on the FX6. Huh? Yeah. Have you found the SDI protocol pain in the butt on the Komodo X when you're shooting docs, running gun, and buying one in December? No. Uh, it's just kind of something you have to live with. Um, even if you're using SDI on the FX6, you should still treat it that way. And I prefer SDI over HDMI. Senpai, I think, I don't know what it is, open source cinema camera. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, so the Senpai, yeah, I won't go into it in this in this live stream, but I think it's cool, but I'm not too interested in it. What mount is that has NDs? So yeah, that's, uh, I don't know, again, sorry guys, I don't know how far behind I am. But this is the, is there a name on it anywhere? Yeah, so this is the Poco Mofage. I oh, know this is the Mofage Poco VND. This knob here, this is the rear BND. They have other inserts, diffusion. You guys know I hate diffusion filters, but um, yeah, there's different things on there. Uh, there's other companies that have other similar products, but they're way more expensive. And the quality on this is still amazing. So 
What gear would you recommend for a run and gun shoot for Sony FX3? I have no idea. I don't know what you're shooting and what gear you're meeting. And yeah, I don't know. What's your thoughts on the Black Magic Cinema Camera 6K? I think it's great. Uh, the foreign factor is annoying. I The Pocket 4K is my first cinema camera I ever owned. And I had it crapped out on me multiple times. I was in Montana. It was snowing. I was in the desert. And it would crap out on me then. Uh, in the cold, it would just die out. I would rip cables out. I would mess up the ports. I would rip ports out. Um, yeah, there was just, yeah, uh, I, they need a box style camera for sure. What part of Montana? I'll be on the Coral Reservation. Am I buying the Atlas Anamorphics? If so, what focal lengths? Uh, I don't know. I'm contemplating. I'm really like those, these DZO Pavos because um, they're 2X, but the Super 35 and the Atlas Mercuries are full frame, but 1.5, but still have a lot of character. So I don't know. Maybe I'll do a video on those. What's your DP and music video Friday? We lost our DP. That's on stage at Burbank. Oh, do I want to? Uh, no, I'm not too interested in DPing a music video that has a Ferrari and stuff. Uh, nothing personal. Um, a lot of my vision type stuff. This is why I keep getting a lot of offers to start DPing projects. Uh, I got offered to go to Europe to DP something. Um, just like little things here and there, more narrative based stuff. I'm not too interested in doing that because um, if I want to, if I, if I DP something, I want it to be a story that I care about or a project that I'm into. And uh, generally uh, I'm very picky with things like that, uh, <clears throat> which is why I lean more into directing rather than DPing though. I am making more contacts, connections and friends and uh, connections that uh, with people with similar minds and stories that they want to tell. So I, I'll part DP those projects. We'll see. How do you learn the rules to be a good writer? I have no idea. I've never wrote anything. That's something I want to get more involved in. Is YouTube chat delayed? I don't know. I'm catching up though. I'm behind. Writing seems to have rules that go into crafting a good story and keeping people engaged. I guess, but like with anything, if you're a good writer, you're a good writer. Um, <clears throat> and you probably don't have to follow the rules. I'm sure there's some rules that can help you, you know, uh, get the ball rolling, which is how I plan to learn. Uh, but I plan on writing whatever the hell I want to write, you know. Do you know if the new Nissi lenses would fit in the mount on the Komodo? I don't think so. Uh, they protrude a lot in the back. That's how they got them all to be pretty equal. So one or two of them might fit, but I think majority of them most likely won't clear, which is a bummer. <clears throat> Black Magic 6K full frame versus the Lumix X or the Lumix 62X. Trying to decide what would be better for running gun style filmmaking. What are your thoughts? Uh, I think I would go towards the Black Magic because you're getting that internal raw inside. I've tried external raw, uh, Black Magic raw from the S52. The color looks a little bit better, but uh, overall, I don't really think it's worth shooting external raw on a lot of these cameras. Um, so yeah, I would probably go with the black magic. I only like open gate for anamorphic, and if I have to deliver both, yeah, same. Oh, shout out film guy. You're in Australia too. All the Aussies are up on here right now. Let's see. I'm trying to catch up here, y'all. Did I ever use onboard shotgun mic on the Kona X? I got the breakout. Yeah, so that's how I plan on using it. Again, I'm shooting solo. So I don't know how much I can manage on audio. So it's easier just to put a shotgun mic into the person's face and get as close as possible. So I think a lot of this stock I'll probably be shooting on the Nanomorph 35 and 50. And then for any B-roll stuff and like inserts, we'll probably be the 65 or the 80. Yeah, Ari Alexa Super 35. Yeah, again, if you're able to get a Super 35 sensor and get extra info pumping out of it, then obviously it's great. But that's a total different thing. Do you see the creator shot on the FX3 story? Yeah, so I actually have been DMing the DP from the creator, Oren. A uh, super nice guy, <clears throat> insanely kind. Um, yeah, I think uh, the whole talk about the FX3, I think it's cool because it shows us like there's no excuse. You don't need fancy cameras to get the job done. But on top of that, I think we're missing the big topic here and that's the way they shot that film. It was kind of run and gun. Uh, 
and the effects they they thought about more later. They want to get everything in camera as good as they could get and make it raw and authentic and worry about the effects and post. Um, so I think that's more important. They could have, they could have probably still shot it on the Lari, uh, Ari, uh, LF or whatever they wanted to. Uh, it just would have, you know, there's more things to manage as you go up in the body size. Um, so I don't, again, I think it's cool. Um, but I think people are going a little bit overboard on obsessing over that. I think it just goes to show again, doesn't matter what camera you have. They could have shot that on the Canon T2I and it probably would have looked great. Um, so yeah. But it is cool. Well, for instance, for when you don't have the ability to light. Yeah, it helps. It is cleaner. Did I just fart? No. Oh, what's up, Joel? <laughs> Do you miss full frame when shooting on the KX? No. Because again, the image quality that you're getting out of the KX is better than any full frame camera that I own right now. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you, and it's 1.3x crop. You barely like notice it. Are you still using X100V? No, I bought that camera four times and each time I get rid of it because I end up shooting a, a lot of uh, 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 film. I end up getting a lot of film. And that's kind of what that camera does to me. It makes me fall in love with film again every time. So it's this like weird, weird cycle of me loving the camera, but then loving film again. Does Mofosh adapter impact image quality? It would you use a clear filter in? I don't know. I haven't tested it. I don't feel like it. It might add some extra flares in there, um, but yeah. I didn't know that. So the breakthrough rear VND has a better clearance than the Mofage. That's interesting. Write whatever I want to write. That's a good takeaway. Learned. Um, let me see. S5 II review. I own the S5 II. Uh, I actually really love that camera. Um, like I wouldn't use it. Then every time I did use it, I was like, why am I not using this more? Uh, but I don't own it anymore. Let's see. And you can strip it quickly to fix it on a go. Yep. Shot mics. Would you recommend for run and gun shots? Uh, I use a, uh, I have it right here. So this is, this mic's even uh, more affordable than uh deities mics. And I watched a bunch of videos. I'm comparing them. Then I compare them myself. The DED sounded more tinny compared to this. This is the Cinco D2. This is a crazy good performing shotgun mic. Uh, it captures a lot of that fullness sound where the DED kind of missed that. And it was a little bit more tingy on the high end. Um, if you guys don't know, I used to do, um, I used to produce music and stuff for like a while. Let's see, an FX3 style center characters come back. Let's see, I love the creator, showed what a good vision. This is a good comment. I love the creator, showed what a good vision with a good and skilled crew can do. Makes me want to shoot more stuff in my FX30. Yeah, I think that's the big point here is that was purely vision and talent, original story. That's one of the reasons I loved it so much. It feels like one of those great, like 90 cinematic, like action packed films. And the cinematography reminded me of like the Thin Red Line and some of my favorite films in the late nineties and early two thousands that were shot on film, but digitally color graded. Um, that's what it gave me the vibe of. Um, so yeah, it all comes down to vision. I, I might do a video on the creator. We'll see. How would I describe, describe my style of filmmaking? I don't know. I don't, don't think I have a style yet especially when it comes to narrative stuff and figuring that out. Um, as I start doing more short films to test lenses and cameras out, uh, I'm sure you guys will start seeing a theme. Any lenses that you have that wouldn't have worked for the Mofosh adapter, they said the clearance. Uh, yeah, the Nanomorph 2.5 or the 27 millimeter. I don't know why I said it like that. Uh, the 27 millimeter Nanomorph didn't fit. Um, there's a few other ones. I don't remember off the top of my head. Most of my lenses fit on it though. Let's see real quick. They mean to text you about, oh, it's Joel. What's the best run and gun video and photo camera for handheld that's out right now? Uh, Pari, uh, I want to say the A7S III. Guys, I always have knots in my hair because I don't brush it. It's pretty bad. Um, yeah, it's hard. I guess the A7 IV, honestly. The Sony A7 IV is probably your best bet. Um, 
great photos, enough megapixels to still do big prints. Um, great video, great low light. Yeah, Kobe said the creators should make you think about how much crew is important. Yeah, vision and crew, guys. Let's see. You're going to stay – you going to stay indie or are you ever going to try to DGA? I'm bored with death with the strikes, though. I don't know what DGA is, honestly. Um, no, so I want to go full-time on YouTube so I can actually step in that direction. I want to tell more stories, more documentaries or narratives, like whatever stories they are. I want to tell more stories and actually shoot cinematic pieces. Shooting the fashion stuff, like there's not much excitement and creativity on those as much as you guys think there would be. Um, you know, they have specific needs. And there's only, you can only be so creative. And it's a little bit soul- um, yeah, sucks your soul up a little bit there if you're someone that's creative and you want to tell stories. Maybe I missed. Are you taking your FX6 or the red? I'm taking the red Komodo. Because again, you have to you have to rig it up the same way you have to rig up the Komodo X because all the little gripes with the FX6. I might as well take Komodo. How are you on that six string guitar? I don't I haven't been playing as much. So I guess a little rusty, but let's see. Let me see. If, oh, let me see. I'm not going to. I have to sing through uh, my teeth because my actual singing is very, 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 very loud. <laughs> so. I won't torture you guys, but that was pretty bad, but yeah. Uh, four, because the Lola is insane. Uh, let's see. Guys, I'm going to be uh, uh, bouncing off here soon. Put in your last question. Speak now or forever. Hold your peace. Um, how's the ND filter situation? Should you on the right Komodo X? Could have the FS6 because of internal Ds. Yeah, again, I have that Mofage Poco uh, Rare VND, and uh, it's amazing. It actually cuts out a lot of the IR. They said it doesn't have any IR cut on it, but all the tests I've done and everything I saw on it, there's no IR. But I don't want to say that because depending on where you're at in the world and what time of day you're shooting, IR can get in there still. So I've worked on shows like Westworld, American Horror Story, Big Union Gig. So that's sick. Um, yeah, so yeah, I do plan on again. Uh, I, I got lost. Um, so the whole reason I'm doing YouTube is so I can tell more narrative pieces so I can work towards that goal. Obviously, everybody wants to like direct a film, everyone wants to be a director, but um, whether I'm being a DP on films that I want to tell or if I'm directing them, um, yeah, there's a lot of um, I don't know, there's a lot of uh, worlds that I kind of live in. Uh, my brain and I kind of want to express them and get them out. Like if I can't be creative and express myself, I, I get uncomfortable almost. Peace out, brother. To Joel, uh, I'm like, those are cool, but I think there's things for a fraction of the price that are better in my opinion. Uh, no lighter or an eternal focus on this time. LiDAR is great, but I would not trust LiDAR for things that uh, I need to make sure I'm focused. Kofi, you can't catch me on camera with this guitar, that's for sure. What's the setup of my live stream right now, lighting camera? I just have a LED light panel above me. There's a grid on it. It's probably like a two-foot long one and two-foot wide or something. I don't know. Uh, that's a, a Jiyun X100 uh, behind me, Molus, the X100 Molus. Um, just a little AKG podcast type mic above me and the Sony ZV-1 uh, USB-C straight into um, YouTube here. Uh, and I just have an eternal LUT, my, uh, my uh, film cream LUT. And then the Module 8 tuner and the Sigma 35 1.4, and I'm at 1.8. Do you have a vent on color grading? Yeah, really older ones, and it's pretty much the same thing. The trick to color grading, guys, a lot of people think there's like a secret recipe to getting a cool look. No, I could give you the best LUT in the world, and if you don't know how to use it or tune it, it's going to look like crap. 
Um, so it comes down to taste. My thing is study. Go look at your favorite films, study the colors, uh, shoot something similar, like a similar frame, put it side by side and figure out how to match them. That's the best way you can learn how to get the colors you want. Let's see. Uh, yeah, Critter Elect Electronics wants talking about guitar stuff, but you know, bro, you know what happens when guitars start talking about guitar stuff. Everyone tunes out. All right, guys, I'm tuning out. I think I caught up to uh, the rest of the chat here. I'll tune out with a little diddly. I don't remember my own stuff. Let me see. Let me see. No, nothing's coming to mind. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Yeah, I don't remember any of my own stuff. That's uh, that's what happens. All right, when's my next stream? Guys, I don't know. I just randomly jump on here. I have a million things to do, but um, I'm kind of figuring out this whole Adderall and ADH thing, and so um, I have a lot of energy. I was on a phone call trying to set up the documentary shoot days, and they're like, I could tell you're on Adderall because you're going a mile a minute. So, um, yeah, guys. All right. Thank you, everybody that tuned in. Uh, these are always super fun. This is like, this is why I'm excited about going full time to YouTube is like this community and being able to like make all these homies, like all you guys who are possibly girls who tuned in on this and we just, we just get to shoot the shit and just hang out and talk about stuff. So yeah, um, as I get more into this, I'll try to build out a really cool um, live stream set up where it feels like we're just chilling out in the back porch with our guitars and uh, yeah. Um, but that's it, guys. Thank you again. Peace.